All right, so we're going to go over the practice quiz for matter one. You'll have a second quiz, at least a second quiz in this section. So this is the first one, kind of chunking it for you so it's not as bad. The first five quest questions are going to be based on heating or cooling curves and it's probably a good idea to label them to start with. So this first one on the left is a cooling curve and I know it's a cooling curve because everything is decreasing. And over here, this is a heating curve. So at the plateaus is where you have a phase change, plateau, phase change, they both start with P, and where you have these sloped regions of the graph, like here and here and here and here, that's where you have temperature changing. So whenever temperature changes, kinetic energy is changing. So temperature, you know there's going to be kinetic energy changes and then with the plateau oops EAU that's going to be a potential energy change and that's when phase is changing so you have your P and your P and your P all together all right question one which interval above represents the particles in the solid phase speeding up Whenever you see speeding up, think kinetic energy. So if they're getting faster, that means that kinetic energy is changing, which means we're talking about a temperature change. So it's got to be one of the sloped portions of the graph. And since it says speeding up, it's not going to be the cooling curve. It's going to be the heating curve. And then the last thing to look for here, it says solid. So which of the sloped portions of the graph represents the solid phase? And that's this one right here. So the correct answer for this one is letter F. On the quiz you're going to get, they aren't going to be the exact same questions. I actually have about 20 different questions I'd like to ask, but just trying to keep it to one class period, I only selected five. So think about something else I could ask. Instead of asking about the solid phase and speeding up, maybe I could ask about the liquid phase and slowing down. So when you study, make sure you go through and you change those key words so that you know you can answer any type of question. Number two, which interval represents the kinetic energy? So again, we're going to be talking about the sloped portion of the graph. And again, we're talking about increasing. So this is just going to be from the heating curve, so we can ignore that first one again. And then a, a major key here to this is that we're talking about the gas phase. So we've narrowed it down to the slope portions of the heating curve, and now we have to figure out which one's gas. Well, gas is going to be this top one right here. So that's going to be letter J. Number three whereas the potential energy, so that's going to be one of the plateaus, decreasing, so that means we're going to be talking about the cooling curve, that's where things are decreasing, within the gas and liquid mixture. So at a plateau, you're going through a phase change, you're going to have two phases of matter occurring. The top plateau here is going to be gas becoming a liquid. So that's going to be your gas and liquid mixture. This phase change is actually condensation. That's where it's condensing. So that would be letter B. Number four, where is the potential energy, so again a plateau, of fusion. Fusion, we talked about the heat of fusion when we talked about the lower plateau, so that would be the freezing point, and then we said increasing. So again, we're going to be looking at the heating curve. We're going to look at one of the plateaus, and to narrow that down, the heat of fusion is this lower plateau, or letter G. And number five, where is condensation taking place? Well, we already labeled that actually as letter B. Label a couple of other things. This is freezing. That plateau on the other graph over here where letter G is, that's going to be melting. And then the upper plateau would be boiling. All 
All right, now some math questions. So this is going to deal with those equations in the heat section on the back of your reference tables and also table B where the constants are. So I'm going to pull those in now. The hardest part uh, about these questions is knowing which equation to use. Since they are talking about a phase change in the first question, they're asking about boiling. That means that you're not talking about temperature changing. During a phase change, temperature doesn't change. So you're not going to use the first one because that one involves a change in temperature. So you can narrow it down to Q is equal to MHF or Q is equal to MHV. The F I like to think of as freezing. If you're talking about the freezing point of the substance, then you're going to use HF. If you're talking about the gas phase at all, or a vapor, MHV is what you're going to use. So in this case, when we're boiling, we're making a vapor. So we're going to use Q is equal to MHV. For this question, we're looking for heat. So Q is what we're looking for. And they give us, they've given us our mass. HV being a constant, you're going to have to look in table B to find and it's 2260 joules per gram. So plugging our numbers in, we have 125 grams, and the HV is 2260 joules per gram. Your grams are going to cancel each other out, so the units we'll be left with will be joules, so all we need to do is multiply 125 times 2260, and we get a huge number. We get 282,500 joules. And then do me a favor so it's nice and easy for me to give you points. Make sure you box in or circle your answer. Number seven, when 2200 joules of heat, that's our Q, is removed, so we're talking about taking heat away, from 825 grams of water, that's our M, at 372 Kelvin. This is our starting temperature, our Ti. They want to know what our T final is. My suggestion to make this easier for you is first to solve for delta T, and then you're going to use your amazing powers of common sense and reason in order to figure out how to, how to come up with the final temperature. So you could technically plug in Tf minus Ti for delta T, but then you'd have to remember to make your joules negative because they're removed. I'm not going to suggest you do that. If you feel really confident that you know what's going on, go ahead. But I, I wouldn't suggest it. So since we're talking about temperature changing, we're going to be using Q is equal to MC delta T. This time we're going to be solving for delta T because we're looking for temperature. So we have our Q. I'm going to plug that number in for Q. I wrote kind of big so I couldn't fit it underneath. M, we said, was 825 grams. C, if you look back here, is the specific heat capacity which it doesn't tell you there, but over here in Table B, they tell you it's 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. And then, of course, we're solving for delta T. So to get delta T alone, I would need to divide by 825 and 4.18. To make this a little less writing, I'm going to do 825 times 4.18 to start with. That value is 3,448.5. Now my grams cancel out. So I just now have joules per Kelvin. So I need to do that on the other side. That's a 5 joules. Kelvin. All right, so now that means these guys cancel out. Yay. 
these guys, since that was the number I got when I multiplied those two, cancel out. So I need to do 2,200 divided by 3448.5. And I'm going to get, it's getting messy, I don't have a lot of room here. I'm going to round this to three digits, and we get 0.638. And this is degrees because joules cancel out, and we get 1 over 1 over Kelvin. Okay. So that means that the temperature changed by 0.638 degrees. So we were given an initial temperature in Kelvin here, 372 Kelvin. And we need to know, are we adding that 0.638 or subtracting it? So we said initially that meant that the heat was removed. So would our final temperature be higher or lower if heat's removed? Well, it's going to be lower. So I'm going to take my initial temperature of 372, and I'm going to subtract my 0.638. And our final temperature is going to be 371 point, and I don't know what you want to round to. I'm going to put 0.4 Kelvin, and I am going to box that in. So that was probably the most complicated question you could be asked. On to the next one. How much ice will melt? So we're talking about a phase change. Okay. When 432 joules of heat is added to the ice. So they've given us Q. That's the heat. They want to know how much. That's going to be M. That's our grams. That's what we're going to look for in our question. So um, we need to decide what equation we're using. Since we're talking about a phase change, temperature isn't going to change. So it's not going to be the first equation. It's got to be one of these other ones, either Q is equal to MHF or MHV. Since we're talking about melting, we're talking about the freezing point. So we're going to use HF. Think of that F as freezing or fusion. Q is equal to MHF. We have Q. Q is 432 joules. We're looking for M. HF, although here it only says heat of fusion, there's a value for that number, a constant, in table B on the front of your reference tables. It's 334 joules per gram. To solve for M, we would just need to divide by the 334 joules per gram. Our joules will cancel. We'll be left with 1 over 1 over grams, which is just grams. So when we do 432 divided by 334, we get 1.29 grams. And then go ahead and box that in for me. I want to give you points, so make sure it's obvious. All right, on to the next question. How much heat is required? So we're looking for Q. For 50 grams of water, this is M, to change from 10 to 80 degrees Celsius. So our delta T is going to be the difference between those two numbers, which is 70. So since we are talking about a temperature change, we're going to use the Q is equal to MC delta T. And now we can just plug our numbers in there. M, we said, was 50 grams. C, if you recall, is a specific heat capacity, which is a constant, which is given on the front of the reference tables, because, you know, looking in one place isn't enough. And it's 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. And then delta T, we just calculated to be 70 degrees. And even though that's Celsius, when we're talking about a difference in temperature, it's always going to be 
the same a degree difference in Kelvin is the same as a degree difference in Celsius. They aren't a different scale. They have the same scale. It's just where zero is that's different. So now our units, grams are going to cancel here and degrees are going to cancel here. So we'll be left with joules, which is good because that's what heat is measured in. And all we have to do is multiply the three numbers and we're going to get 14, oops, 14,630. Don't forget your joules. Can't have any naked numbers. All right, one more math question. How much water, so again, we're going to be looking for M, will freeze, that's going to become important when we decide which equation to use, when 7250 joules, that's Q, are removed from water. So we know we aren't talking about a delta T because there's there's no temperature change. We're talking about a phase change and we're going to use Q is equal to MHF because we're talking about a freezing point. So we're going to be looking for M. We have joules 7250 Joules. In this case, you really can't make your joules negative because you'll end up with a negative mass and you can't have a negative mass. So you're, you don't want to, even though we know it's being removed or it's being lost, you can't use that negative in this case. M is what we're looking for. HF is the heat of fusion, which is given on, as a constant on the front. That's 334 joules per gram. To get M alone, we divide by that. Our units cancel. This all cancels. We'll be left with 1 over 1 over gram, which is just grams. So now we just divide. 7,250 by 334 and you're going to get 21.7 and our units are grams. Now the back. Actually the entire back side is going to be about forces of attraction and particle diagrams. So a little refresher on forces of attraction. The forces of attraction are going to be based on the molecule's polarity. So first thing you're going to want to do is figure out the molecule polarity. And then based on that, you'll be able to determine the force of attraction. If a molecule is nonpolar, so it's symmetrical or it's one of our diatomics. It's going to have van der Waals forces. If it is a polar molecule, it's going to have dipole forces, dipole, dipole, or dipole forces. And then there are very, very special dipoles, polar molecules, that you had to memorize have a special force of attraction and they are these three, ammonia, HF, and water, and they have a super strong dipole called hydrogen bonding because the atoms that are bonded to hydrogen in each of those have a very high electronegativity. So looking at our question again, the force of attraction, HF, HF is one of those three. So it's going to have hydrogen bonding. And the reason why you can say very electronegative and that will work. Next question, what force of attraction is present in O2? Well, O2, the bonds in it are nonpolar, so the molecule is nonpolar. 
So since it's nonpolar, the force of attraction will be van der Waals. And I'm okay with you abbreviating VW. And you can say because it's nonpolar. Next one, what force of attraction is present in SEBR2? Well, it's not one of our three. Um, and without drawing it, you might not know if it's polar or nonpolar. So we should probably draw it. Selenium has six valence electrons, which means that it has two unpaired electrons and would make two bonds. Bromine has seven valence electrons. It has one unpaired electron and can make one bond. So what's going to end up happening is, and I'll draw the molecule over here, you're going to have selenium and then a bromine off here and then a bromine off here. Since the bonds are between two different elements, they're going to be polar. When you look up the electronegativities, bromines is higher, so I, that's why I pointed toward bromine. Probably didn't even need to do that to see that this molecule is not symmetrical, meaning that it's going to be polar. Therefore, the force of attraction, I have this backwards, but that's okay. The force of attraction is going to be dipole. So this should actually be there, and that should be there. It's okay if you do that on the quiz. I'm, I can figure that out. Next question, what's the force of attraction present in KR? Well, KR is not bonded to anything. How could there be forces of attraction? Well, and that's just it. KR is a noble gas, and it's going to act like a nonpolar molecule. So it will have van der Waals forces because it's a nonpolar. So if you have a question about one of the noble gases, we treat it as though it's a nonpolar molecule. Next question, which of the following has the highest boiling point? Well, boiling points and freezing points have everything to do with the forces of attraction. These are both nonpolar molecules. It would be easier almost if one was nonpolar and one was polar because the polar forces of attraction, dipole, are greater, so that one would have been higher. These are both nonpolar. So in order to compare them, you're going to have to compare them by size. So oxygen is element number 8. So you could just add 8 and 8, and the size of this would be 16. I brought in the periodic table because you might not have the atomic numbers memorized. Um, bromine is number 35, so when you multiply that by 2, you get 70. So bromine is going to have the higher boiling point. You may have also realized that because bromine is a liquid at room temperature and oxygen is not. So the answer is Br2, and your explanation would be it's larger. Or if you recalled that it's a liquid, you could say it's a liquid at room temperature. Next question, which of the following has the highest melting point? We have pH 3 or NH3. So um, I immediately recognize that this is special. This is something I had to memorize. In fact, here it is up here in our list of H bonding. So normally if I had two what appear to be polar molecules, and they are, they would, they would both look something like this if you were to draw them out. So normally, if you have two polar molecules, you would compare them by size, just like we did the nonpolar. But since NH3 has hydrogen bonding, it's always going to have a higher melting or boiling point. So we're going to say NH3, and the reason why is it has hydrogen bonding, which is a stronger force of attraction than just dipole. All right, next we're going to draw the molecule ion attraction. Molecule ion attraction is when you have an ionic substance, in this case RB 
Br dissolved in water, which is what the AQ is telling us. So you're going to take your metal ion and give it its charge. And then you're going to take your non-metal ion and give it its charge. And then you have to orient your water molecules. Try to draw at least three around each. Since bromine's negative, it's the hydrogen side of the water molecules that's going to be oriented toward the bromine ion. And then the rubidium will have the oxygen side oriented toward it since the oxygen side is more negative. Like so. All right, the next three are all phase diagram or phase particle diagrams. The next one we're showing water as a liquid. Um, so water has three atoms. You could draw them like the sticks, uh, stick and ball like we did above, or you could draw them more like this space filling. When you do that, you need to make the oxygen different from the hydrogen in some way. I'm going to do that by filling in the oxygen. Or you could do it by making the oxygen larger, because it really is a larger atom. So I'm going to draw in a little beaker into my space. I suppose you could use the um, the space I've given to draw as the uh, space for the liquid, but I'm lazy enough I don't want to draw that much. So here's my beaker that I'm going to fill my water molecules with. You want to make sure that your water molecules fit all the way across because when you think of a liquid, a liquid takes the shape of the container but not the volume. So you want to go all the way across the bottom, but you don't want them to be terribly orderly. You don't want them to be too perfect because water or liquid water doesn't have a perfect orderly arrangement of molecules. I have a hard time drawing and talking at the same time. And then make sure you have at least six in there. I'm going to draw one more because I don't want it to look like it's not filling the width of my container. So there we go. There it is as a liquid. Up to number 19, we're going to draw neon as a gas. Neon is one of our noble gases. So as a molecule, it's not going to bond to anything else. So I'm not going to draw different particles. I'm only going to draw one circle for the one atom in a molecule of neon. So they're not bonded to anything else. And then because it's a gas, I want to be sure to kind of spread them out through the space like so. And then this last one, we're drawing a diagram of I2. So I'm going to have two atoms of the same, oops, so two atoms about the same size and shape. Okay, if you color one, you got to color the other because they're both the same element. And we're going to show it as a solid. This time, once again, because it's a solid like we've drawn before, it's going to have its very own shape. I want to draw at least six molecules of I2. So right now I have four atoms, but that's only two molecules. So I'm going to keep going. There's three. Now I'm going to stack them up so that it's obvious it has its own orderly shape. Okay, so I did the bare minimum there. And that's how you would draw iodine, I2, as a solid. And that's the end of the quiz.